Good evening, everybody. This is AJ Woodson. This is Black Westchester presents the People Before Politics radio show, the pre-primary edition. I am your host, AJ Woodson. My partner, Damon K. Jones, will be joining us shortly. Our two guests are candidates running in the Democratic primary on Tuesday. Um, New York 17 congressional candidate, Mondia Jones, who is with us right now and um, Westchester District Attorney um, candidate Mimi Roker, who will be joining us around 6.45, maybe 7-ish. So before I get into the show, there's a couple of things I definitely want to say. Um, shout out to, um, as, we, as, we come up, as we're coming to, uh, up on this election, we just had an election for school board and for library trustee. Um, Mal Vernon, I just want to congratulate um, Brenda L. Crump, a uh, longtime friend of the show, Cynthia Turnquest Jones, another longtime friend of the show, and R&B legend Jeff Fred. They are your new Mount Vernon School Board uh, trustees. And shout out to Caitlin Gleason and Hope Marable, who won for the library, Mount Vernon Public Library trustees um, election. Um, so I just want to shout out them. Um, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Um, I have not shared this yet. Um, I need to start sharing this. I'll wait till Damien gets on. Um, let me share it in a couple of groups real quick. Um, we have, I want to shout out, I, I want to also shout out again, and I said this on a few shows, I want to shout out all of the young people that are out there protesting, peacefully protesting. This is literally, I'm 54, and I keep saying this, I was two when Martin Luther King was killed, which was the last major protest of this sort that I've ever that I that I can recall. Um, so this is like the first time in my life, um, over as cities in over fifty in every one of the fifty states, over twenty countries. Um, but I, I want to um, I want to encourage those. What's up, Damon? I want to hey, encourage. What's, up? Here, what's happening, man? I want to encourage all of those protesting to not give up. Just because that president signed that little executive order thing or whatever that was, that's not really worth the paper is written on. We are fighting for the change of legislation for police crimes overall. And you have their attention. Please do not give up. Do not give in. Continue to fight. I am proud of all of y'all out there fighting. And I just wanted to get that in. Of course, my, my partner in crime, Damon K. Jones, has joined us. You want to say a few words to the people real quick? Uh, what's happening, this? everybody? My dear, what's happening? Thank you for coming, man. I appreciate you coming um, for us to um, get the last push out. Um, I saw that you was up in the polls. That's a great thing. Um, that's good. People, you know, people are coming around and, and people are getting the message, man. And um, um, I you and, and Mimi, um, I think for Westchester, um, it's the way we could go go about change. You know, I, I, I think that's what y'all guys is was needed in, in those offices. So, um, you know, thank you for coming on last last minute, you know, but we definitely wanted to um, showcase both of y'all guys. And, and so people, I know they started early voting, but I know a lot of people are going to vote on the 23rd. So we want to make sure that uh, people see your face and, and, and know your name. And when they go into the voting booth, um, put a circle or X or color the square circle, whatever they do, <laughs> you know. X make, marks the square. No. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Make, make sure it's you, man. So I, I thank you. And, and as AJ was saying, you know, we have an opportunity for change now. You know, uh, we're the change that, that we've been looking for. And we could do it through the vote the process, right? We could start the process through the vote, man. And we wanted to make sure um, with, with, with no bones about it, you know, White Plains, Greenberg, Elmsford, um, the 23rd, if you go out there, man, vote for Mondeer Jones. You know, um, he has been steadfast in, in giving a constant message. Um, and that message is, is in line with what we need to get done today um, down in Washington, D.C., man. So thank you, brother. And, and the floor is yours, man. <laughs> and I, I just want to say one more time, and for those um, 
Wait, Mimi will be with us somewhere around 645, 70. She okay. um, has something previous to do, but she okay. will be joining us. So if you're looking for her, she is coming. Um, and uh, my brother Mondia, man, just um, this is a last look at the candidate um, before the election, two days before the election. Um, people have seen you. We've interviewed you very early on. You're one of the first we interviewed, and we went through all the other candidates. Um, tell the people why they should vote for you. Well, first off, First off, let's start beginning. Who is Mondia? Not the candidate, the person. You know, we always hear about who the candidate is. Who who's Mondia Jones, the person? Let's let it, let's get to know the person. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm always happy to be on this show. This is this is home for me, right? This, these are my my folks. Exactly. Um, and and I'm grateful to anyone who's tuning in right now live or who will be watching this, especially before June 23rd, which is the last day to vote in person. Amen. Um, Mondaire Jones is a kid who grew up in, in Section 8 housing and on food stamps and whose young single mother still had to work multiple jobs just to put food on the table for us. Uh, and so when we talk about things like a $15 minimum wage being absolutely necessary at the federal level, that is a need I know to exist firsthand from watching my mom struggle to be the incredible provider that she was. Uh, and of course, so many women all throughout our district uh, or New York 17th Congressional District, I should say, which consists of parts of Central and Northern Westchester and all of Rockland County, uh, and all throughout this country. They've been doing that forever. Um, and so my mom also got to help raise me from my grandparents. My grandfather was a janitor. And my grandmother cleaned homes. And when daycare was too expensive, she took me to work with her. And now I get to run to represent the same people whose homes, our community, I was able to make it to Stanford University to, to, uh, to work in the Obama administration at the Justice Department on criminal justice reform before it was popular to do so. You know, it didn't take national protests uh, and, and, and unrest over the past two or three weeks for me to center criminal justice reform and, and policing reform and racial justice in my campaign. Uh, and it should not have been. And I was the only person who had it on his website, frankly, uh, before the events of this month. I think that's pretty uh, telling uh, and, and really uh, demonstrates what I mean. more people in office for whom policy is personal. I, when I was growing up, no one ever told me I'd be a member of Congress. I don't come from money or from a political family. Uh, and in fact, growing up, I never imagined that somebody like me could be in Congress uh, and, and, and now to be, you know, I, I guess, according to the poll a few days ago, the leading contender in this race up by 11 points with 24 percent of people undecided. So we're going to be going after those folks, too, between now and we already are. I got folks phone banking right now because we don't take anything for granted in this race. Um, we work as hard as we've been working from the beginning of this race when uh, many people counted us out. Uh, when they didn't think that a, a, a kid like me, a black kid from Rockland County who didn't come from anything uh, and had never held elected office. Uh, despite his other qualifications, which they still try to minimize right now, by the way, you know, it's like having a Harvard Law degree and working for Obama uh, and uh, and working for the Westchester County Law Department. So many of these folks are still not good enough. Uh, but I thank God for people like the New York Times editorial board, which endorsed my campaign a few Fridays ago. Okay. Uh, Bernie Sanders, AOC, Elizabeth Warren, Julian Castro. We've been endorsed by three former presidential candidates this cycle. Uh, and we are we are defying expectations every step of the way. And and uh, and you guys mentioned AJ. You mentioned young people. Shout out to young people who are who are the impotent. They're they are the driving force behind the organizational power that this campaign has. Uh, this is going to be a story of how young people largely stood up against the pharmaceutical industry, the defense industry, uh, and the fossil fuel industry. And 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 yeah, the the IDC in the case of Mr. Carlucci and defeated everybody and elected a champion for working people. Uh, and I'm so excited about what's gonna happen on Tuesday. Of course, we may still have to be counting absentee ballots too, right? Because th we know those won't be counted until July, but I hope to be up by the end of Tuesday night. All right, all right, all right. Now, now we talk about not every candidate because they're running and, 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 and because of the aftermath of the, pro the, the protest because of George Floyd. Every candidate is talking about criminal justice reform. What does that mean to you? And you spoke about being involved in that before it was a popular thing. Talk more about that, because that criminal justice reform is a very important thing to Black Westchester and a lot of our audience. So, and, 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 and speak about, if elected, what some of the things you would like to do. 
absolutely. This is, I'm really passionate about this. You might you, as you might imagine, as a black man in America, um, when I was 19 years old, I chaired a committee on the National Board of Directors for the NAACP. Uh, when I was a senior at Stanford University and the Palo Alto police chief made comments that embraced racial profiling, I organized my classmates and we worked with adults in the Palo Alto community to get her to resign and to obtain policing reforms in that department. But when I was a third year law student at Harvard Law School, what did I do in my free time? I went into Roxbury and Dorchester and provided free legal representation to people facing criminal charges. My first client was a homeless guy who was being harassed by local law enforcement and inappropriately charged, frankly. How do you, how do you trespass when you're sitting on a public bench? Thank God for lawyers like myself, uh, but it's really messed up the way people like me are over-policed, over-arrested, over-prosecuted, and over-sentenced for things that other people never get into trouble for. Uh, you know, more recently, I've, I've been on the board of the New York Civil Liberties Union, uh, and just generally speaking, I've really centered racial justice in my campaign. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't have to be explicit to be an issue of racial justice, right? So I'm the only candidate supporting Medicare for all. Guess who disproportionately dies from COVID because of <laughs> illnesses, Black and Hispanic people? Uh, you know, get, I'm, I'm, I'm the candidate supporting um, student debt forgiveness. Guess who disproportionately has difficulty paying for college and is saddled by crippling student debt? You know, I'm the candidate supporting a housing for all platform, this massive investment by the federal government. And also, by the way, clearing this long waiting list for Section 8 housing right now, we don't talk enough about. Guess who disproportionately has trouble paying for rent and mortgage in this country? Uh, so those are also what I would describe as anti-racist programs. And as we talk about criminal justice reform, I'm happy to talk about it, but then I wanna talk about something else because it's not just criminal justice reform and policing reform, it's systemic racism generally, which is in all aspects of our society. On the policing front, we have to make sure we do national standards. And we can do that by saying, well, if you're gonna take federal funding, local law enforcement agency, you have to require officers to identify themselves. Uh, you cannot use a chokehold anymore. You have to in engage in de-escalation tactics. Uh, we know that people are capable of doing that when the, when the person arrested is white, right? Dylan Roof, after shooting up a church, uh, got driven to Burger King on his way to the precinct. But you got, you know, uh, a bunch of folks who, have, who are unarmed, uh, completely unable to pose any kind of threat, still having a life snuffed out of them at the, over the course of eight minutes and 46 seconds, uh, if, if you're George Floyd. So, um, so there's that. We have to eliminate qualified immunity. <coughs> The Supreme Court created, right? There was no statute that created this law that said uh, that if even if you violate the constitutional rights of civilians, you can still evade responsibility. So we have to get rid of qualified immunity. Criminal justice reform, generally, we have to end mass incarceration, invest in alternatives to incarceration. I don't believe in locking people up for, for using drugs, any kind of drugs. I don't believe in locking people up for that. Let's treat people. Let's also legalize cannabis. We can regulate it, but we got to legalize it. Right. Uh, Let's also um, eliminate mandatory minimums in sentencing so that judges have discretion on how to sentence somebody and can take into consideration uh, the, the totality of a person's life circumstances. Let's end private prisons. Uh, and, and, and let's make sure that we are making, allowing people to re-enter society and, and reducing recidivism. What does that mean? It means if you're in prison or jail, let's give you job training because we know that reduces the likelihood that you'll recommit those offenses. And let's stop erecting arbitrary barriers like pre preventing you from getting a Pell Grant or getting federally subsidized housing once you've served your time and you're just trying to be a good citizen. Right. right. As I've been saying at these rallies all over the district, uh, in the most affluent places, uh, in, 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 the, in the most affluent, whitest places like Irvington or, or in racially diverse, lower income areas like Porchester, it is this. Uh, systemic racism, our concept of that has to be broad enough to include uh, a, a, an economic system that concentrates 90% of the wealth in this country in white communities and only 5% in the black and Hispanic communities. Uh, systemic race, our, our understanding of systemic racism has to be broad enough to, to encompass uh, a public school system that is largely funded by property taxes, resulting in the concentration of tens of billions more dollars in white communities and the deprivation of black and Hispanic kids of critical educational opportunities it's a healthcare system that um, conditions your ability to get necessary medical care on your ability to pay for it, uh, which disproportionately harms black and Hispanic people. So we have, to be, we have to be comprehensive in our understanding of systemic racism. It's not just the individual examples of police killings. That's not gonna be enough. Right. 
No, brother, you are you 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 you're on point, and this is the crazy thing about it is that a lot of the police departments um, in the South and Midwest, East Coast, um, not a lot in in, in New York. Um, they're um, nationally certified, right? It's it's a it's an organization called Kalia. Right, and and they and they certify police departments on 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 national standards. Um, but the problem is the 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 problem is what we're seeing is that even though these some of these police departments saying they at national standards, right, there really is still no oversight of those standards. You know, if 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 those if those standards, no, there's only one um, police department in Westchester that is certified and that's Scarsdale Police Department, right? So, so uh, we've been trying to push for, for police departments, you know, even to get to that na national standard because uh, Westchester County um, Department of Corrections is, is, is certified under the Nas National Correctional Association, the ACA, um, which we have our national um, accreditation from. And, and the process is very tedious. You know, they come in, they 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 go over all your policies, man. It's it's like a complete audit, you know, if you know, of of your policies, of your use of force policies, of all those policies, and yada 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 yada. They walk through, they even interview the inmates, like how are y'all treated here? You know, so it's it's a whole thing. And 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 it's it's the same with and it's and it's the same with Kalia. And I I, I think one of the ways that is to have national standards. Um, the United States is the only, probably the only progressive country that don't really have national standards in law enforcement, which is, which is crazy, right? Which, which, which is crazy. Um, so, you know, having you down there fighting for that, you know, is, 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 is a great thing because, because that's what we need, man. And I mean, we, we need more voices. We need more voices from our community. Um, we just need it. And brother, you, you hit everything on the head. How, how do we, hit all levels of, 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 the, of the system because it's systematic, right? Racism is, is, is systematic and, and it's embedded in our laws. And, we're gonna, and we need people strong enough, you know, you know to change it. You know, I, I, I say it all the time, man. I, I thank, you know, all our New York state elected officials for, for passing all these laws, you know, but, you know, I've been on the job for 30 years, 25 of those 30 years, we've been talking about an independent special prosecutor. You know, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, um, that um, people have to burn down stuff <laughs> for, for, for politicians to listen, you know? I got, I got two state legislators running against me right now who just co-sponsored repealing 58 within the past two weeks when that's been, that legislation's been pending. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They had the nerve to say on Facebook today, um, oh, well, where was he in White Plains today? Like I haven't been at every single other rally and this, like, so, so your favorite candidate was at the rally, but he didn't co-sponsor repealing 50A until national protests. It took, it took somebody's death that in a, in a Twitter video that went, went viral, you know, pe people, right. people like the ceremony of it all, but they don't, want to do the <laughs> they don't want to do the work, the actual work. I don't care if you're kneeling in kente cloth on, on <laughs> <laughs> if you're not prioritizing legislation and getting it passed and building a movement to enact that legislation that's going to materially improve the lives of black people in this country. That's right. That's right. No, you're absolutely right, man. You're, 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 you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, the people that endorsed you are powerful people that's down there trying to fight for change, man. And, and, and I think a lot of people um, have noticed in the last couple of weeks, you know, who's the person um, that we need down in, down, down there to take Nina Lowy's seat. Um, also to make history, man, you know, also to make history here in, 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 in the 17th district, man, you know, you know, to have a black man down there, brother, you know, speaking truth to power. Um, Westchester and Rockland is not used to that. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's why some of Westchester's democratic establishment was, uh, you know, has, has had low expectations at first, but I, I think we have been proving them wrong every, every step of the way. And I don't mean to lump, by the way, everybody in that category. There've been plenty right. of folks very supportive of me. Right. Uh, but but you do you do see that the committees had their favorite candidate, 
uh, and, and well, <laughs> the polling speaks for itself. And, and that's because people want to be inspired. Right. I'm not running to just be one of 435 people in Congress. I'm running to provide transformational leadership. Right. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that you have to have had elected office. Uh, it, it, largely, it, it means how, how much do you care and what are your other skill sets that right. you Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. AJ, you got any questions? Hey, now, now, what you just said, um, you know, since I did all the interviews, one or two of the candidates did say that they are the only ones with experience in running government. And um, that's why they should be elected. Um, I want you to elaborate more on that since, since you know. Well, yeah. So what good is your experience if you voted against a housing bill that provided historic protections for tenants in 2019? Uh, if if you um, you know if you didn't if you didn't sign on co-sponsor repealing 50A until a few weeks ago when it's been pending since January 2019, uh, it's, it's what I mean when I say I would rather have somebody for whom policy is personal than someone who has spent decades in Washington or a decade in Albany. Uh, Mr. Carlucci, to use another example of a state legislator we well know spent most of his career caucusing with Republicans despite running and getting elected as a Democrat. Absolutely. So I would rather have leadership, like actual leadership, uh, than, and, 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 and the votes to, to back it up uh, than to have someone who will simply check a box and by virtue of that feel entitled to a position. And again, I'm grateful to the people of New York's 17th Congressional District who are not taking their direction from some local Democrat, you know, who tells them who to vote for. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And we're, and we're seeing, you know, and we're seeing a lot of the district leaders and a lot of the, a lot of the, um, in a lot of these committees, um, they're starting to have independent thinking, which is, which is great. You know, um, you know, we got Mimi coming on and, 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 and a lot of people are thinking independently of, of, of the party. Um, because they because they want that type of change they they, they want um, um, they want to see actual justice man and, you know and it comes through all you know like it kills me because I don't understand you know I, I say all the time I say well if the lawmakers tell me that they don't know what to do and they're the ones that's creating the law right if it's a bad law right then change the law you know, I, I mean, you change, change the law. There's, in New York, we, we have no, no excuse to blame Republicans. We're the majority in, in, in almost every, you know, in major democratic cities, we are the majority. Um, and, and, and hell, we got like a super, I don't even think there's a Republican left on the county legislature. So, I mean, you know, I, I mean. I think there's one left, there were two, and one of them just turned, changed his party to Democrat. Right, so. So if you ever been to the county legislator, bro, you know, like they separate the Republicans from the Democrats. So now you got like all these seats on one side, right? And you just got this one Republican sitting over here by himself. That's the craziest thing I ever saw in my life. But if you have a super majority like that, I mean, there's no excuse. It's, it's no excuse that we can't get these laws passed. The, the, the Democrats passed, they, they, we, we wanted these Democrats in office. We have a Democratic governor on the state level. We have a Democrat controlling the state Senate and the just Democratic Senate majority leader. We have the Democratic controlling the assembly and, 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 and a House uh, the assembly spe a speaker for the assembly. We have a Democratic county executive on the county level now um, after two terms of, of, two terms of, uh, of Astorino. We have uh, the majority rule in, 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 in the county legislature. Like, Democrats, you know, this is a dangerous thing, too. Now, you can't blame it on the Republicans that didn't go along with you. Now you control all facets of everything. What are you going to do with it now? Now you have to show and prove. Now that we put y'all there, you have to show and prove. That's, you know. You know, uh, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity in our politics. You know, what is happening right now in the Democratic Party, where people are getting challenges, incumbents are getting challenged, mm -hmm. uh, when, when people are not entitled any longer, you know, folks, folks aren't just going to wait around for you to start doing the right thing. 
uh, if they have what they believe to be better ideas, they are going to submit them to voters for consideration and let voters decide. And, and that is a beautiful thing that doesn't have to be scary. Uh, it, it is the democratic process. Right. All the democratic process. And, and so I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to be electing new leadership in, 20, in 20, 2020 um, all throughout New York State. Uh, there is something happening in New York. It started in 2018 uh, with, uh, with AOC and, uh, and with defeating the IDC, you know, actually defeating Jeff Klein and, and others defeating, you know, um, defeating state senators throughout the state. And, 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 I, and I'm grateful to be part of the continuation of that movement uh, of people, many of them young, many of them people of color who are not waiting their turn. Instead, they're offering voters a choice. Uh, and I'm so grateful that I, that I've allowed my, my, my moral compass and my belief system to, to guide me instead of uh, anyone who would, who would try to uh, sidetrack me. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. and, and, and let me tell you, uh, one thing I think um, in, from the beginning uh, when we first met and um, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine and he made a point that was real clear. It's like, listen, man, Mondia started when it was, when it was hard you know, when, when, when Nita Lowy was still in the race, right? And, and, no, and you were pushing, you know, your platform and you were speaking truth to power um, when everybody thought Nita Lowy was still running. And, and, and I think, you know, and that shows courage because, you know, she, she was the, you know, she was the immovable object, right? And, and you decided to step up and say, you know what? You know, it's time for change. And I'm going to put my platform out there. I'm going to show people who I am. And um, in that process, while you was doing that, and and you were showing that you know you're you're not scared of the of of the of the of the system itself, and and the entrenchedness of you know a, a personality, you know, like like you know, Lowy, um, and he was respectful. He wasn't disrespectful. And then when she dropped out, you know, everybody came out the woodwork, you know, and it's like, you know, where were y'all when, when he was standing in? So you got to have, you know, you got to show the respect, you know, for what you was doing. And, 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 when, and when I was having that conversation and I was like, yo, man, you're right. You know, you know, I, I was like, yo, you're right. Like this dude was out there speaking truth to power when it wasn't popular in the Democratic Party. When, when people thought that Nita Lowy was still running. They, they, my opponents all saw me as the, as the person in the race, the, the one person left over in the race, and, and they looked at it and they said, oh, I could take him off. <laughs> <laughs> so we, got, we got a comment and a question from a listener, uh, Evan, and I can't pronounce the last name, so I'll just say Evan M, said, happy to vote for Mr. Jones. If you are able to ask him, what are his thoughts about push, trying to push progressive policy change to entrench middle-leaning Democrats? Yeah, I, I think I think this is a great question, and 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 before I answer, let me just say, you know, if if I feel like if I if if I if I knew the answers, uh, the the complete answer to this question, the progressive movement would have gotten even further along than we are right now. But I do think we're gaining. I mean, Medicare for All is a mainstream idea right now. We're now a majority of the American people support it. Overwhelming majority of independents and Democrats support it. Uh, and nothing like a, a, a global pandemic to really nail home the point that, that everyone deserves health care in this country and we're impacted even if we have health insurance and somebody doesn't. What my strategy for, for um, sort of articulating my, some, some, of my, some of my views to centrist Democrats is to show how it impacts them negatively if we don't change things for the better, right? Uh, so, you know, Medicare for all is the easy one from my perspective. Uh, if if we're going without health care, they're pregnant to everybody else, right? COVID nineteen. Uh, if you want, if you're out black and brown people dying from from COVID nineteen, we'll support the only policy that would literally ensure everybody in this country. Uh, and if, 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 you, if you need more ammunition, your wages would go up if your employers didn't have to worry about spending so much money providing health care if it was the government itself providing that health care. Um, that, that is a fact that Medicare for All would save society $5 trillion over the next 10 years 
Uh, and instead of your employer saying, well, I'm going to pay you less, but I'll give you great health care, the government can say, I'll give you great health care, and then your wages can go up from your employer after they pay sort of a flat fee. Um, you know, when it comes to something like student debt forgiveness, people are saying, well, well, I don't, I had to pay my, I had to pay off my, my debt. Uh, why, sh why, sh why is it that other people shouldn't have to um, figure it out on their own, right, without any support from the government? Well, if you're worried about your property taxes being so high, uh, make the observation that Westchester Rockland County County is an extremely expensive place to live and young people cannot afford to move here. Expand the tax base so you don't have to pay, so you don't have to show the burden that you're having is if we can start to uh, eliminate the debt that is sort of crippling them and, and causing them to have to live at home with their parents and their grandparents instead of living out independently, owning a home so that they can, you know, I mean, there have been studies that show that there is tremendous economic benefit to forgiving um, student debt. It's been skyrocketing even as the cost, even as wages have remained stagnant over the past several decades. Um, but I also think it's showing, I think it's showing centrist people that progressives can win. Katie Porter is a progressive member of Congress who's now famous, and she flipped the seat from red to blue. And she, she says repeatedly that she won that race that used to be held by a Republican by running on Medicare for all. Everybody wants health care, and people think that other people deserve health care as well. Uh, so I think, it's, I think when you show people that progressives can win, as I'm doing in my own primary, uh, uh, then centrist people are more likely to accept progressive ideas instead of dismissing progressive candidates as, um, as not being able to win elections. Um, another, another listener, um, Marvin Church said to say hello um, and to let you know that hey. he's listening. Um, <laughs> for people that don't... Um, Marvin's people, a really big support. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, for those who don't know, you want to know more about you, um, um, and want to take one last look at you after this interview. Um, social media, website, stuff like that. So, you know, people can check. Oh, no, you forget that question. Marvin had a question. You got to ask said, it because um, I refreshed my screen and I lost it. Oh, it says, it's unfortunate that a candidate is is trying to buy the election with, with, with using over $4.45 million. Um, I guess he wants you to comment. <laughs> the, the, the New York Times, the New York Times published an article for those of you who haven't seen it yet, a few days ago, saying, "Can the son of a billionaire spend his way to a house to a New York house seat?" Mm. Uh, and my answer is nope. Uh, you know, Mr. Schleifer has spent over now four point five million dollars in farm in his pharmaceutical industry inheritance. His father's a billionaire to purchase this election. And when Evelyn Farkas uh, called him out for it, he called her a snake. And he said that she had been spending so much time in the back rooms of Washington that she can't see through the fog. I was offended for her, for him to talk about her like that. Uh, and also, all she was doing was telling the truth, which is that he was distorting the democratic process by spending unlimited sums of money and drowning out the messages of other people. I thank God that I've been able to fundraise the way that I have. Mm -hmm. I mean, not. I worry that my message would have been drowned out. Right. I think it says something that even after spending so much money on television, starting as far out as March, when none of us could afford to be running television commercials back then, he is still, you know, I'm still 11 points ahead of him after only going on air on TV on May 20th, on May 27th. So again, I thank God to the people of this district, New York 17th Congressional District, for evaluating the candidates, seeing who's what, and, and who actually cares about this district, who didn't just move back here uh, uh, and, and is just spending money because it's whatever, because he can afford it, uh, when he could be eliminating poverty and peak scale with that kind of money where he's decided to locate his. <laughs> exactly. uh, and, I'm, and I'm disappointed in the people who, who have uh, allowed themselves to be bought off, frankly, who are so-called leaders of our community who have endorsed them. Uh, money is a powerful drug in our politics, and we desperately need campaign finance reform, and I'm going to be fighting for that. Uh, and this ex experience emboldens me further to do that. Right, when I get to right. exactly, exactly, exactly. We've seen it time and time again where people buy their way in, 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 into elections, man, and, and, and it's crazy. Go ahead. Well, that leads to another question that I've asked all the candidates, and I guess it's timely to ask again. Um, what do you feel about uh, the need for campaign finance reform because we've seen in elections on every level um even down to 
um, school trustee election in, in Mount Vernon, like, you know, on every level that um, candidates can grossly outspend other candidates. And sometimes good candidates can't compete and, and we don't necessarily get the best person in the seat, but we got the person who could afford to do the most mailers or the first, you know what I'm saying? They do take the most ads out. And the, 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 there were smaller people that were really good candidates that can't compete um, and can't get their message out. And um, some people are calling for like campaign finance reform. So what do you, what do you feel on, on, on that? Oh. Absolutely. You know, there, there are two main proposals for campaign finance reform. Some people support a voucher system, which I support, um, and other people support a, 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 a system of matching dollars. I'll support that too, if that's the best that we can do. But I think ideally we'll do a voucher system. Uh, here, there's a bill called House Resolution 1. It passed the House, but it went to die in the Senate because, of course, Mitch McConnell presides over the Senate. He doesn't want to see any good legislation passed. That, that passed in January of 2019. And one of the features of House Resolution 1, H.R. 1, which was a democracy reform bill, which included things like automatic voter registration, independent commissions to, to draw congressional districts so they're not gerrymandered in the way that we see right now, but it also included a public financing system of matching dollars. The problem with matching dollars is that you still have to have... Uh, and so you're still excluding a lot of people in this society, poor people who tend to disproportionately be black and Hispanic, who are saying, well, yeah, I got a little bit of money, but I'd rather spend that money on putting food on the table or, you know, or, or paying rent or something or saving. Right. Instead of donating it to a campaign. So a voucher system is, is a set of dollars where the, federal, where the government gives every individual a set of dollars and says, you can donate this money to whichever candidates you please. Uh, you, you, you prefer. Uh, and so it's not like someone's going into your pocket and taking out money uh, and, and you're still able to participate in the process by advancing the interests of certain candidates by giving them money. So, so I think the voucher system, like what they have in Seattle, is ideal. Uh, but obviously a matching system is, is, a, is a big improvement upon what we currently have right now. And that would help more people who are lower income, who know what it's like to struggle in this economy, who understand that it's not just enough to get rid of Donald Trump and the way that my opponents... So explain, explain the matching system. What, who matches what? Just explain that. Okay, so let's say... Uh, so one example of the matching system is, well, um, if you if a candidate raises $25 from someone in, per, in the district, uh, then, then the government will match that by six. So, so, if you, so you live in New York 17 Congressional District, you give me $25, um, it's, it's, it's meant to encourage small-dollar contributions. Um, and, 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 and to amplify people who, would, who don't have wealthy friends. So if your friends can only give you $25, uh, we're gonna match that by six, we're gonna times it by six. So, so the government would say, okay, I'm gonna give you, in that case, $150, because you got a $25 contribution. So it's a six to one matching system, is just mm -hmm. an example of it. And that way you're helping candidates who, who, don't have, who don't have friends who can give you $2,800, which is the maximum in a congressional primary. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's your grandmother or maybe it's your neighbor uh, in an apartment building who, um, who has $25 to spare. That, that money gets amplified uh, and, and it helps candidates who don't have uh, wealthy networks be able to successfully run for office. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's, that's um, um, the, uh, the person, uh, Evan, who asked the question earlier said he appreciates your answer and he appreciates the show. Um, so, so again, so um, going back to social media, uh, website, how can people get in touch with you these last two days um, um, before the event? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please visit mondaireforcongress.com. That's M-O-N-D-A-I-R-E-F-O-R, congress.com. You can go to my Instagram. Uh, it's Mondaire for Congress. Uh, you can go to my Twitter account, which is just Mondaire Jones. Um, and of course, uh, you can you can email me at info at mondaireforcongress.com. We check that throughout the day. Uh, and I'm very grateful that those of you who have already, many of you have already been phone banking and texting. You can sign up to volunteer on the homepage of mondaireforcongress.com. And of course, you can make a contribution using the donate button at the top of the homepage because uh, it's hard to run against a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Mondaire, what's your um, line number? Oh, uh, for my, for the, the campaign office? Yeah, no, the, on the, on the ballot. On, oh. on the ballot. What's your ballot? 
got it. So my, my name appears second. If you live if you live in New York 17th district, so if you're if this is Black Westchester, so if you live if you live in some place like um like Elmsford or White Plains or Peekskill or Ossining or Terrytown or Dobbs Ferry or Port Chester, um or, or Sleepy Hollow, any of those places and more in, in, in central and northern Westchester County, uh, you will see my name second. It's after Catherine Parker. It's, it's Catherine Parker, who's no longer in the race. She's endorsed my campaign. Right. Ondaire Jones. And then third is Adam Slyford. And you got five other people. Oh, so you're second. On, so you're. I'm second. Uh, what Which line is it? What is, what is the Democratic line? Who is it? A? a? Well, uh, Democratic, yeah, probably A. But, uh, you know what? I got my ballot right in front of me. I'm going to vote in person now. But um, yeah, it's A, Democratic A, yeah. So it's A what? It's just a, it's just a separate ballot. It's it's because it's it's two different pages. Um, oh, it don't no, say. It like it's like two A, three A. Does that yeah, a two. Oh, well, I see what you're saying. It's two A. Sorry, it's two A. Two A. That's that's it. That's all you got to know is <laughs> going there. That's all you got to know. Look, you know. For name, no. Look for my name, Mondaire Jones. <laughs> <laughs> two just, A. Just in case they swoop up the numbers or something. Yeah. <laughs> the stories I've been hearing about the information people have been getting from Next my, thing you know, in the new printout, it'd be somebody else at 2A, right? <laughs> just look for my name. <laughs> now, 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 you talked about that. Let's, and we joking. Um, in Westchester, and I don't know if it was all over Westchester, I got a lot of calls about um, people's polling places moving. Um, people like some of the members of our show, Lorraine Lopez and Dr. Bob Baskerville, both said they had a, a polling place they could walk to, and now their polling place is on the other side of town. And several people complained that when they went to check their polling place on the state uh, site, their polling place was the same, but on the Westchester Board of Election site, their polling place was different. And we had a young, uh, we had a Mount Vernonite, um, Elias Goodsight, uh, Damon. Let me just tell you what his came to. His polling site said Mount Vernon, City Hall, 1 Wallace Avenue, Mount Kisco, New York. <laughs> I heard, I heard, that, he, story. I heard he, that He posted it on Facebook, like for real. So I understand they messed up on a lot of, um, they were supposed to remail them out or, or whatever. So, so, and another thing people are talking about, and even the president is throwing it out there just in case he lose, that the mail-in process is going to cause mail fraud, voter fraud, and all this other stuff. What, what do you, what do you say about that? Yeah, you know, and in Rockland County, uh, just to add another story, I, I got a message from someone who says, "Well, my presidential ballot came, but my congressional ballot didn't come." So I reached out to the, the Board of Elections Commissioner in Rockland, and she said that with with respect to 393 people, that that mistake was made. You know, this, you know um, let, me, let me start by offering a solution in the immediate future. You can vote in person and override anything you do by mail, okay? So yeah. if, if, you, if you voted for the, a terrible candidate, please go and vote in person now that you learn about me. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you feel like you didn't get your ballot and just know that you can override it by going in person, now you can go Tuesday, June 23rd. Right. That will override anything you've done in the past in this election. Wait, 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 wait. If you voted, if you mailed in your vote already? That's correct. And you decided to change your mind, you could actually show up in person and vote? Is that, that And that will override your prior, your prior vote. I, I confirmed that with the Rockland County Board of Elections Commissioner. Um, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna, when they do the absentee ballots, they're gonna, the reason, one of the reasons it's gonna take so long is because they're gonna cross-reference it, right? They're gonna say, well, this person requested an absentee ballot, but did they vote in person? Uh, and in the case where somebody did both, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't happen. But in the case where somebody did do both, uh, they're going to say, "Well, uh, the, the the voting in person controls." You know? Yeah, but you're in Rockland, man. We're in Westchester. Yeah, I don't know if that's for the Westchester yeah. people. I'm not sure. I, I want to, and, and I want to be careful about know, giving brother. out information because I haven't confirmed that, and I haven't, I've never heard that before. So, I, yeah. I, maybe I, that's what they do in Rockland. Yeah. <laughs> but under Reggie Lafayette. Hey man, let me tell you, <laughs> you'll never know, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, man. I'm how about, telling you. how about this, then, before I get in trouble? Just call the board, of, call the board of elections, please, and confirm. Before yes. Somebody, before somebody try to sue me, call the board of elections and confirm <laughs> that it's true that if you go in person, that that overrides anything you do. 
male. But that you no. Know, but what I'm saying is that makes common sense. But you never know in Westchester. That's all I'm saying, man. It makes it makes common sense. It would it should override it, 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 it right it in person and you give the signature and you vote. But this place here, man, I, I mean, dude, like it's, it's unfortunate. Like a lot of the elections I have written to the Southern District of New York, like you have to come in and monitor this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. They know me very well. You know, you have to come and monitor because it's just, it, you know, um, when I ran for city council, there were people that literally thought I won. And they were like, you're kidding me? <laughs> like, like how, how did you lose? Everybody was voting for you. Like, like, like literally. So I was just like, well, you know, it, it, it is what it is. You know, it, it is what it is. You just never, you, you can never trust the system here. And, and it's unfortunate. But you can never you you can never trust the system. And with other elections, I have written um, the U.S. Attorney to come in and monitor because we always felt here in Westchester that it was a conflict of interest that the city committee chair and the Westchester and and the county chair and the commission of the board of elections all are the same person. So <laughs> so how the hell who do you go to regress right who 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 do you go to solve who do you go to solve your problem right if if they're all the same person right so so that 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 is always that has always been our issue and i i, I was told that the the state did pass that it was a conflict of interest but i i you know i'm not sure if that law i, I know there was a bill out there um but you know, you never know here, bro. You know, it, it is what it is, man. So, is there anything? You know, is there anything? Um, Mimi's um, signing in um, shortly. Is there any um, thing we haven't asked you that you want people to know? Any um, last words? Any message that you want to the people? Anything that you? Yeah, just that you know, uh, most of you tuning in have probably heard about me, seen the commercial, gotten mail from me. Uh, or, or, or have heard about me through a friend, please do uh, give further consideration to my campaign. It is important that we use our vote strategically in this election, okay? Uh, please take a look at the poll and see who's polling where. Um, I have the, the best chance of winning this election, and I, and I respectfully uh, ask that if you, are, if you want to see better representation in Congress, that you, that you strategically vote for me in this election. Everybody vote for Mondeer Jones. Um, not because just we got the same last name, just because he's a he's a hell of a candidate and he's qualified to do the job. Somebody just told me, oh, oh, David's only voting for him, only endorsing him because that's his cousin. And I was like, I don't think they're related. <laughs> I think he just likes him as a candidate. But the rumor, but the rumor did get, but but the rumor did get out there that we was related. Somebody right. started that crazy rumor. I don't you know, know who it was. Listen, some... You know who started it. You know who's family started it. <laughs> <laughs> So, my dear, you're All welcome right. to, to hang out with us, and we're going to switch over to um, I'm gonna, our next kid. Yeah, huh? I'm going to let me do her thing because Mimi's incredible, and I'm not going to. I'm going to. I'm going to exit out, but I'll, I'll watch from. Uh, I'll watch. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Bye. Absolutely. Um, Bye. Thank you, dear. Good to see you. Good to see you, dude. Good luck. Thank you. And I would like to introduce the next candidate on our pre-primary edition of the People Before Politics radio show, uh, Westchester District Attorney Candidate Mimi Roker. Um, welcome to the show. Um, I, I, I originally wanted to have you on. Um, Black Westchester does not endorse a lot of the local races, but we thought that this race was too important not to lend our support behind the candidate we believed was the best candidate because this is such an important election as far as criminal justice and all of that is concerned. So um, it is, um, I, I, we, we announced, oh, excuse me, we, we announced um, um, that we are endorsing you. Black Westchester has endorsed you and giving you the cover of the paper, which only the digital issue came out because we didn't do the print. But, um, and I welcome you to the show to give people one last look Especially if they're undecided, why they should vote for you? 
Um, well, first of all, thank you, AJ and Damon, for, um, for having me on tonight and for endorsing me. I mean, I do understand that you didn't do that lightly. Um, and and I, I really, I appreciate it. And I feel like, you know, we've really gotten to know each other these past couple of months. And so I know that that's an endorsement that came from, um, you know, from your heart in a way and, and from what you believe in. Um, and, and I think we share a lot of the same beliefs and values about what needs to happen and what needs to change in our criminal justice system. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I can get into policy differences between my opponent and I, and, and I will, but let me just say that basically what it comes down to on, on Tuesday is voters have a decision to make about a real choice. And it, and it is, you know, we're both Democrats, it's true, and this isn't about who's more of a Democrat than the other one, or, you know, who, who hates Trump more or anything like that. It's about who has a vision and the passion and uh, the, the, you know, the innovation to really work to change our criminal justice system. And quite frankly, the current DA does really well at doing lip service. You know, he says a lot of things, he calls himself a progressive prosecutor, puts a lot of labels up on his website and links and photo ops. But at the end of the day, he doesn't have a vision. He doesn't, I don't, I don't even know that he totally understands what's happening in the country right now. And I think it was starting long before the murder of George Floyd. I mean, I've been talking with you guys. I remember I was on back in, I think it was January or maybe even December when I first announced. And we were talking about the need for real meaningful criminal justice reform. But now it's, it's even more important because we can have all these ideas, but now we have the movement. We have the, the, the time when I think you can really make these things reality. Now, you know, how exactly it's all gonna play out and who we're gonna to get to agree to everything, you know, yeah, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna take a lot of work. It's not gonna be easy, we know that. But if you don't have the vision and you don't have the passion and you don't understand why criminal justice reform is so important, then you're not gonna make it happen. And at right. the end of the day, the reason why it's important is because we have to end the racism in our criminal justice system. We have to end the racial disparities and our, the unfair racial disparities in our criminal justice system. And we have to end police brutality and corruption. And police brutality and corruption is only going to end or, or be, be whittled down. You know, so it is not a common occurrence in our, in our culture, which it is right now, unfortunately, while we have many, many good uh, police officers and law enforcement, unfortunately, this is way too common. And it's only going to end if we have accountability. And this DA has shown himself over and over incapable of, for whatever reason, of, of bringing the cases that are necessary to bring and doing the work that's necessary to do, which, which is hard, to hold police officers accountable. And at the end of the day, that is something that I am um, going to be proud to do. Because it, as a prosecutor for over 16 years, I believe that when you have police corruption and police brutality, it actually is, 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 first of all, just morally wrong. It is race, it can be racist if it's directed at black and brown people. Mm -hmm. And it makes the job of law enforcement harder. So I want to help you know, re revitalize the idea of law enforcement as a force for good in this country and in this county. And we need to start doing that, you know, brick by brick. So I think that's what it comes down to. It's leadership, it's vision, it's um, passion about changing the system, not accepting the status quo. That's the main choice that voters have, and it's a stark one. Right. And, I, and I want to be clear, too. I want to say, when you look at the national attention, the protests, in, in cities in, in every one of the 50 states and in over 20 countries, the demand for change, a protest that is probably the biggest protest in this country since the shooting of Martin Luther King, which I was two, like in that era there, like I wasn't around to really understand what was going on. I've never seen a protest of this magnitude. And if, and for Westchester County voters, if we continue to vote for a district attorney who has turned a blind eye on corruption, 
all of your marching and protesting is for it, 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 it was wasn't it's just thrown out the window. And and I just wanted to say in in our endorsement to you, I wrote this and I want to read it. So I, um, first let me start with why we feel there is a, that we need a change in the district attorney's office. Um, because you just can't make statements like that haphazardly. While we have not been able to figure out why our current DA has consistently turned a blind eye to police and governmental corruption since he's been in office, even though his website makes the case for his reelection says he's been bold and progressive in the execution of justice. Scarpino ran on prosecuting corruption, but has shown himself to be a little more than a male version of his predecessor, Janet DeFiore. At least Janet DeFiore did prosecute two Yonkers cops, um, but it was more to cover herself because she prosecuted several cases these officers were involved in, and that's if you can call eight to 20 weeks of weekends in jail a prosecution. I'm not sure if it's, and this is what I wrote, AJ Blackwell says, I'm not sure whether it's incompetence, ineptitude, or just plain sub submissiveness Westchester County District Attorney Anthea Scarpino has his failure to investigate, indict, and prosecute corruption has has given individuals like Joseph Spezio here in Mount Vernon car blanche to just steal uh, from taxpayers. There have been several cases that we've covered: a case in um, missing guns in in Eastchester, a case with 200k missing from the White Plains um, PBA. Um, I have been informed by very well, um, um, very good resource, uh, good sources that he basically had enough for, uh, 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 um, um, what do you call them cases, a RICO case against Spezio, but yet he closed the investigation. I've talked to others that he's closed investigations without even speaking to victims. We've had several cases in Mount Vernon. We have one individual who has cost Mount Vernon over $3 million in excessive force complaint payouts, yet he was not on this bad cop list. Like if anybody's credibility should be questioned, he should be on there, but he shouldn't be still working. That's, that's beside the point. But he was on, he, he was not on the bad cop list, which we pressured him to put out because he hadn't put out because his investigator was on the list. And then, and you can just search, go to Black Westchester and search his name and see the wealth of articles and stuff that we, so, so this is not personal. This is from a long list of situations that we feel he has failed and especially failed the city he calls home and claims to love, Mount Vernon. So these are what has gone into, and I've had extensive conversations and interview with Mimi Roca, and these are what went into us stepping up to endorse Mimi for, for district attorney. And while we feel, especially with the climate going on right now, we need to make a change and we need to make a change. If you didn't vote, you need to make a change on Tuesday and protest at the ballot box and get Scarpino out. And that's, exactly. that's, that's and, what I have to say. I, I want to say I didn't, um, I, I, with all, with everything, I was so, so busy, man. These Zoom forums are just, just, yes. it's, just it's just overwhelming. But um, I wanted to make sure tonight that, that, that I say it live um, in, in defense of you uh, Mimi, because I didn't see it, but I've, I've got calls from people from Greenberg and White Plains um, when he falsely said that, that you failed the Kenneth Chamberlain family. Um, I, I, I have the letter and, and, and I think when you, when you go so, when you go that low, right, when you're that desperate that you want to invoke um, someone's family member that was killed by police and that was seeking justice and and to try to tie you into something that you had nothing you had nothing to do about you know like only people that you know deal with the southern district deal with police write the letters know that that it it, it, it wasn't you and i want people to know especially in the white plains um um, um greenberg area um it was never Mimi Roca, right? 
it was never Mimi Roca, and I have the letter, and 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 I'm going to post it later. The letter from Randolph Scott McLaughlin, who is the who is the 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 attorney for the Chamberlain estate and Kenneth Chamberlain, and Mimi has never been mentioned in in that. Um, it was David Kennedy. Anybody has been dealing with police brutality in Westchester County um, know that we will reach out to David Kennedy. Um, Mimi's name has never been mentioned. Um, I, I didn't even know. And I'm always writing letters. <laughs> I never wrote a, one letter to Mimi about, uh, about police oversight or, or anything. But for him to invoke that, I, I think that's a sign of desperation. And it's, it's, it's a sign of somebody that we can't trust right in, in in the office of the high of of the highest law enforcement officer you know in charge in westchester county when they will lie and 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 put their opponent in an investigation in a case that she had nothing to do with from the beginning i i appreciate you bringing that up damon and, and that's right i mean the fact is i had absolutely nothing to do with that um investigation um, the reason um, that the person you mentioned, David Kennedy, is is on the letter, and it's interesting. If Mr. Scarpino doesn't know that, then you know that's kind of surprising that he's been the DA for three and a half years, and he doesn't know that David Kennedy is. Look, he he does the civil and the civil rights work for for all of the Southern District, um, and you know the the fact of the matter is that the federal case um, concerning Mr. Chamberlain's killing was a civil rights case. And, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, whether that case should have gone forward. You know, I can offer opinions on that, um, but I wasn't part of the decision making. But the fact of the matter is, and, I, and this is, I know from talking with you and, and Kenneth Jr. that he understands this, that the main way to hold police responsible at this moment in time, given the structure of our system, mm -hmm. is not through federal civil rights actions. It is through criminal actions at the district attorney level. And it can't, you know, maybe, look, there is, I think, a good argument that, that the federal civil rights statute is way too narrow. It is such a hard, it's even harder than the burden for proving, um, you know, murder of, of different levels um, at the state level because, you, because of the uh, racial intent that you have to show for the federal civil rights action. And I'm not saying, you know, th those, it's not that those should never be brought, but we can't just punt it over and say that we're relying on the federal level. We, it, it has to start at the DA level or, or the attorney general. It has to be at the state level. Police brutality cases need to be treated like other criminal cases. That's the bottom line. And, and they're not right now, right? They are given... Um, kind of a, a, a it, it's, it's like criminal cases, understandably, and, and should be hard to prove. I mean, the beyond a reasonable doubt, it, it, it should be a very high standard. Prosecutors should not be easily able to prosecute anyone for any crime. But for police officers, it's sort of like there's this built-in extra protection, you know, because they're police officers. And, and I think that's actually kind of upside down. Because the bottom line is, if they're police officers and they're entrusted with the public trust, then when that is violated, it, they should they need to be held accountable. Because because how else can we um, how else can we trust our system, our criminal justice system, our police uh, forces, if if we if we aren't um, holding them to that standard of public trust? So I, I think yeah, I mean he, he it's clearly an act of desperation trying to throw me into something because he, he just doesn't, he doesn't have, he can't stand on his own record. So he's trying to somehow, you know, mix mine up. And he's done it in, in, in other examples too. Right. But the bottom line is the failure of our system and not, not just in Westchester, but mm -hmm. certainly also in Westchester is the failure to even investigate these cases. I mean, let's look at the reporting about Mount Vernon, right? <laughs> he sat on these recordings for nine months. We now know through the, the second set of recordings that when the um, police officer and his attorney came back after nine months and said, hey, what have you done? They said, okay, well, who, who are we supposed to be talking to? What's his name? Where does he live? I mean, nine months, you know, basic information. And then in Mr. Scarpino's own words over the past couple of weeks, what did they do for the investigation? 
they asked the police officers who were under investigation if they wanted to come in and talk to them. Really? I mean, that's what you do in like a traffic accident. You take people's statements. It's not what you do in police right. corruption cases. Those are the cases where prosecutors should aggressively investigate. You try to do undercover work in the first place, which now we've lost that opportunity. And you use the power of the grand jury. You use search warrants. I mean, there's all sorts of tools that absolutely were not touched. And Mr. Scarpino can say, well, she doesn't know what we've done. You're right. I don't know what you've done. But what I know is what you haven't done. I know you didn't track down the um, drug dealer, he calls himself a drug dealer, a narcotics dealer, that the reporter found who was framed and whose story matches exactly what is on the tape of one of the police officers. Exactly. exactly. He said no one That's ever amazing. spoke to him. So I know what you didn't do. And, it, and it's, it's, it's just, it's really remarkable. And I know that you kept using those police officers to prosecute cases, to swear out search warrants, to swear out arrest warrants. That to me is, is really stunning, you know, that even with these serious allegations and, and some degree of proof, even if you weren't yet prosecuting them, it's, it's not like these were just, you know, kind of, oh, well, someone said something. I mean, we have real substance here. I'm not even talking about, you know, the charges. But you stop using the police. You don't keep arresting people and searching people based on those police officers while they're under supposedly under serious investigation. That is the whole the whole problem with conviction integrity that he also doesn't seem to understand. Right. Right. And and and, 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 and I just want to say and one one since he had these tapes last year, these cops should have been on the bad cop list. Because their integrity was definitely questioned, questionable at the time, and that's what this <laughs> list is about. And these cops are also not on the list. Right. And, yeah, and, and, I found I, I thought about that too, right? And and yet he had police officers on who had DUIs from 1985, who frankly, you know, that that's not a credit, that's not a straightforward credibility issue. So yeah, I don't know how he decided that. And and but you see that he either didn't understand or didn't take seriously that there were problems with, again, not talking necessarily about even the, the could these cops be charged or not, right? Sitting here right now, I don't know that for sure. Right. Looks to me like there's a lot of meat on that case, but I can't say that right, right now. He's right. right about that. What I can say is that there was a real investigation to be done here that was not done and that he should have stopped using them, but because he didn't, he didn't even think to put them on, the, on this list. And, and that's, that to me is a failure of one of the most basic principles and responsibilities of a prosecutor. It is, it is just a total uh, failure of ethics to, to not pursue this kind of case, to keep using those police officers as if it was business <laughs> wait, as usual. Wait, wait I have to, I'm sorry. So our, our <laughs> co-host who's not here, Dr. Robert Baskin, Dr. Bob, he said, dude, it ain't hard to find. AJ and I used to see him outside Richard Thomas' campaign office on Fourth Avenue all the time in 2015. So he was—he was, he was only, and I know he looked familiar when I saw him. That's why I remember him. Um, but th that's what bothered me about that case because with this, and 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 furthered my point that I even made a video yesterday. He said that there wasn't enough information, or he said it was all. Um, What's the word? Uh, hearsay. He said hearsay. It, well, he tried that at first. Right, right, yeah. Right. So his, but, his his claims about why he didn't do anything have changed. Right. Go ahead. So so so, I, and 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 this is my limited understanding on how this this works. But in my understanding, as the district attorney who has subpoena power, and he's oh the other thing he said no witnesses came forward. Right. It's your job to then subpoena some people and get some information firsthand that you can get and investigate. Would you wait right. for a witness to come? That's like somebody sitting home that does not have a job for three years and said he's not working because nobody knocked on his door and said, do you want a job? Like, I, I to me, that's I have a problem with that. And shout out to um, Joe Murray, who's listening, who is the attorney for um, the, the officer we're talking about. Well, and what's, what's even more, like, you know, and I know Campo, you know, and I know Campo, but that tape, you know, you got the, you got the officer saying he gave the drugs back. 
you know, to the drug dealer. Like that, that's, that's, that's crazy. Like that, that is, that is unheard of, you know, and, you know, and, and I really feel bad because so many of these guys I know, you know, from working with my wife, but, 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 uh, but like to hear something like that, you know, and that's not enough evidence to bring them in. Well, but it, even, it, it, at least so, I mean, bring them in for questioning. Because right? yeah. when the first story came out, when the first story came out, which didn't include the first news report, which right. didn't include the excerpts from the recordings with um, Officer Campo, Mr. Scarpino said, oh, it's all hearsay. You know, we couldn't charge it. It's all hearsay, right? First of all, I don't agree with that. But OK, let's even say that. that, that wasn't the point. The point was, why didn't you investigate it? And then when the second story came out and all of a sudden it had someone basically admitting something on tape that clearly any first year law student would know is hearsay, he changed, Mr. Scarpino changed his, you know, why he didn't do it. And he said, now he started saying, well, she doesn't know. She doesn't know what we've done. Like he, he dropped the whole hearsay argument because he couldn't make it. It's like he doesn't even know what's on the tape. Right. He was making an argument that didn't hold up when the second story came out about with, with those recordings, because I'm not sure he still to this day knows what's on those recordings. And that's not blaming, frankly, an investigator or a prosecutor in his office. That is a failure of his leadership. Because mm -hmm. if you're the DA and someone comes into the office with this kind of information, he's right. You don't just say, okay, we can charge this, but you make that a top, top, top priority in your office. I mean, because it is about the integrity of the whole system. The whole system doesn't work if we don't thoroughly get to the bottom of this. And if the whole integrity of the whole system doesn't work, then who can we right. trust? And, and I say that as a prosecutor who comes in with some you know, inherent trust in the system but I'm not gonna trust it unless I get to the bottom, like the like nook and cranny bottom of whether these allegations have any degree of truth. One, whether I can charge them, but then even if I can't charge them, is there some truth here? Is there something going on that needs to be addressed even if not through the criminal process? And he he didn't even try that. I, I, I you know, to mm. this day, I think me, he still doesn't know. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Can, did you, I'm sorry, Jamie. Joe Murray said, I heard ABA Hussleby, I'm not sure if you pronounce it right, resigned the day after the story came out. He was just a sacrificial lamb. I didn't, I didn't know that. Well, I think it did. I think January 1st, there'll be a lot of resignations. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, you know, as someone who's worked as a supervisor, I mean, I wasn't the U.S. attorney, but I did, I did head up the White Plains office and I've mm. supervised people um, for years, you know, as, as a prosecutor. At the end of the day, the buck stopped with me and then with my superiors, right? I, I, I had to, it was my job to train the prosecutors to do the right thing. It was my job to okay. make sure that they knew that when something like that came in, they dropped everything and treated it like the five alarm fire that it should be and that I was looped into it, okay? And so, you know, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I don't know these, these individual prosecutors, but, but, but at the end of the day, this is not about them. This is about the leadership right. in the office. Right. And so I hope that, you know, the prosecutors there understand that this isn't me attacking them. I think that it is up to the district attorney and the chiefs and the supervisors in the office exactly. to, to appropriately train the prosecutors. And I'm going to, I'm going to try that. Everyone has a chance with me. You know, but but they can blow that chance, right? If they show in any way that they don't prioritize integrity over everything else as a prosecutor, that's it. That to me is is where is the a hard line. Let me to draw. let me, me ask a question. Is there is there a is there a culture of worry of of, of worrying about um, numbers? Um, than justice, worrying about how many cases you get settled or, or plea bargain, um, and knowing that these cops, they're not credible, but we're gonna just, we're just gonna get a plea 
we we know we can't go to trial, right? <laughs> because if they if the, if the person defendant has any type of decent lawyer, right? You know, if they have Leo Mayo, if if they hire Mayo, they're going to drop. They're not going to trial, right? So they know, you know, certain things like that. So you know, is there almost like policing where where Uh, Do we lose? I think Damon froze. I think Damon, he looks frozen. He never is yeah. quiet for that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Damon froze. Say that his end. Yeah, and we, we'll have him back in in a minute. Um, yeah. I, while, while we're waiting for Damon's audio um, video to come back in, um, I, now I got phone calls, and I promised that I would ask you this question. Um, someone who is in law said, they they still undecided on who they're going to vote for. And they said, one of the things they have never heard you speak about in any of your interviews was the kind of diversity, and speaking about diversity in the office, mm -hmm. what you would do to bring more diversity to the office. They said they never heard. I said, I think I've heard us say that a few times, but you know what, since the person, and I, and I just text them, to tell them to tune in and I was going to ask this question. So you're speaking to them and whoever yeah. else about speak I'm about- I'm happy to speak to them and I'm happy to speak to them. Yeah, directly. No, I, I definitely talked a lot about it, but you know, look, there's, there's a lot of talk out there right now and it's hard for people to, to catch every one of it. Um, and in fact, several of the people and groups that have endorsed me um, have you know, made that like a, something, you know, one of the main things we've talked about is how am I going to diversify this office? Why? Because Mr. Scarpino came in promising to diversify the office and hasn't really done it. You know, he's got, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it looks like tokenism, right? Like he, he's, he's appointed one um, black person to an executive position and you know that's what he that's what he hangs his hat on and that that's not so much about diversity as it is about having a talking point for your campaign which is exactly one of one of the problems i i have with his his uh leadership style um the way to really diversify the office is first of all to be transparent about it like right now nobody has any real idea of what the office started at when he came in and what progress he's really made. He throws numbers out there like, I've increased by 50% the diversity of the office. 50%, well, what did it start at? And, and I don't even know if that's, I mean, he, he, he says different percentages at different times. Right, right, we right. We need real numbers, okay? And also, what does diversity mean? I mean, I, I you know, look, I, I saw several hires that he did between September and December. And, you know, I think only one of them out of six was a non-white person. Um, several of them are white males. Now, I'm not saying all white males are bad and you can't hire any, but, but we need to look at the whole picture, first of all. Like, and, we need, and, and I need to give you, the public, the people I work for, the real numbers, right? So you can see what I'm talking about and not playing the shell game. And then I also need a plan. And I've pledged um, to come up with a plan in, in my first, you know, 100 days in office, as they say, although I, I hope it doesn't take me that long, but I already have a lot of ideas. I mean, first and foremost, what we need to do is we need to attract a new generation of people to become prosecutors who want to become prosecutors. Because the fact of the matter is that right now, you know, it's probably not that appealing to black people, to brown people, to women, to, to, to uh, people, LGBTQ people, to be prosecutors. And, and so how are we gonna diversify the office if they don't even want the job in the first place? Well, how do we make it more appealing? Well, we start redefining what it means to be a prosecutor, that right. it isn't to Damon's point that he was making, that it's not just about numbers and convictions. Right. It's actually a public service. And when I interviewed people in the US Attorney's Office, I wasn't the person who ultimately made the hiring decisions. That was you know, the, the US Attorney, um, but I was on a committee that helped you know, field the applicants. And one of the top, top questions that we always ask, and I think is really important, is why do you want this job, right? Why do people want to become a prosecutor? Is it because they want to have trial experience? Is it because they think cops and robbers are cool? Or is it because they want to do public service? And if so, what's their track record in that? Because those are the people I want in this job. I want people who believe and look at this as a form of public service, because it should be. I don't know that it is always, but it should be. And so that's part of it. 
And then we've got to go and we've got to recruit. We can't just wait, sit okay. back and wait for the applications to come to us and fall on our lap of the right applicants. We've got to go and recruit. We did a lot of that in the, in the Southern District. We did um, panels at law schools uh, for Black Bar Association groups, Black law student groups. Go out and what, what the job is, um, encourage them to apply, go to law schools where you're going to have uh, more minority students so that you have a bigger pool of applicants. I mean, there's, there's a lot to do and take, take recommendations from the community. Now, everybody goes through the same hiring process no yeah. matter what, no matter right. who they're recommended by. But of course, people in the community here, you know, are going to know people at law schools here and jobs here who, who they think might be good applicants. And, and, and we have to have a rigorous application process too, so that we're getting people with the right integrity and um and and system of, of belief about what justice means right i, I think you I, I think you're 100 percent right when 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 sky pino first got into office um the black community in westchester um put out an olive branch um we understood and and many organizations the naacp the urban league multiple organizations um, we understood um, that he was not um, Janet DeFiore, and um, we tried to be clear with him that the, the frustration that the community has against the district attorney is not against him personally. It's, it's just what has went on under, un, under Janet, and he, had, and he had a great opportunity. He had a, he had a great opportunity, you know, to change that, and, and, and like you said, we 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 asked for look let's let the community play a role in the process if you if 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 you're looking for um black applicants male female latino applicants you know come to us you know we could reach out we we could be the 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 ears to the ground and put it out there for people that that might want in in, in the district attorney's office he did none of that and when it came to um, the opening of his chief investigator. He didn't even put out that there was an opening, right? And we heard it through the grapevine, through, you know, flies on the wall, that, look, this is what's going on. He, he needs to hide. But by the time the community got together to even submit, he hired Chief McNerney from, 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 from Greenberg um, Police Department. So, you know, I mean, I tell people all the time, a lot of people don't know um, since Lattimore came in the office, every other month, he meets with stakeholders from different civil rights organizations and, and organizations every other month. You know, sometimes the meetings are great, sometimes the meetings are bad, but we, but we come out with an understanding that, hey, listen, we want better for our county. We want better for our our, our law enforcement departments and and we want to see reform and and that's it it's a work in progress you can't change a hundred years of, of racism and racial bias in in you know in in one term we know that it's a reality but at least Lattimore is 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 sitting down at the table he's taking applications he's taking recommendations and and we expected the same same from but he just didn't do it I, you know, and and it, and it and it was crazy. And then when it came to, you know, the corruption, you know, it just like he put blinders on, you know, it, 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 he put blinders on, and then they were stopping investigations. You know, how do you stop an investigation and you and you don't even talk to the complainant, right? You you don't even call the complainant up to say, hey, listen, you know, um, what's going on? I got your paperwork. I got that. You know, I know of former police commissioners went there with evidence. He didn't do nothing. Councilman Andre Wallace, as many times he went up to, you know, even being assaulted, didn't do anything. So, you know, you know, after a while, you know, you just figure either he doesn't want to do anything or someone in his office doesn't want to do anything and they're influencing him, you know, not to do anything. And, and I think um, he has made a grave mistake and um, hopefully the, the people of Mount Vernon and the people of Westchester 
this election would would make the right right choice you know to, to try to change this around because it's just getting worse you know it's it's, it's really just getting worse and and, and you know what and, and what kills me for the life of me i can't understand why nobody no other elected official is, is really being vocal on it i mean because people are people are getting hurt out here you know and it, and and it's crazy i mean it, it's it's law enforcement Right. And, and, and then nobody's going to say anything like somebody has to say something. Right. Somebody has to say something. And if your district attorney is not going to say anything. And then, like Joseph Murray said, and he's watching, if you go to the feds, right, as him, as the lawyer for Bavel, so the feds will call the diesel that we're investigating. So that stops the feds. So now they put the hole on the feds, even if the feds say, you know what, this guy got some credible stuff. Let's see what's going on. Well, first let's call Scarpino and see what well, we're investigating. So well, they said, well, all right, they're already investigating. We're, we're not going to do know, One of Scarpino's many um, different sort of defenses of himself that he came up with over the past couple of weeks when we were on, when he was still willing to debate me, because now he stopped. He, he, he wouldn't even agree to the News 12 debate. Just didn't, didn't agree to a date. Okay. I wish News 12 had had it anyway. Exactly. That, that's not how it he wouldn't even agree to a Black West Chester debate either. He never, he never answered us back. No, no, no. no he, he stopped debating me about, I don't know, oh, I can't remember when the last one was, but he said we had done it several times and that was enough. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I would have liked some more opportunities. But anyway, one of his defenses of himself of why he hadn't you know, charged the police officers or, or even investigated it is he kept saying, the FBI has looked at this and they said there's no case. Well, guess what came out in the latest reporting? That the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, my old office, just asked the, uh, the attorney for the whistleblower police officer for the recordings because they did it. And they didn't even have the recordings. Yeah. You know, that, that, but you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, look, this is a case that, frankly, should be looked at at the state level. It should have been. And that was a wasted opportunity that we can't get back. But um, if the AG doesn't take over the case, then, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that the feds now will, you know, will look at it. Now, right. now as, 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 I, know, I know a lot of people who feel that the, the district attorney office has failed them. If we have a new district attorney in, does that district attorney have the power to then go backwards and look at some of the cases where the ball has been dropped or you just have to move forward? Like, Oh, no, 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 absolutely. I mean, you know, first starting with the cold case murders, right, which, which he never looked at that he said he was going to. I mean, there, there's, I, I don't know the number offhand, but there's a, a whole list of cold case murders. I mean, some of them, uh, we know about, and I know, I've heard directly from people in Mount Vernon, victims, family members, as well as advocates who have gone to the DA's office and said, we really want you to look at these. We need to get closure for the families. And he basically just said, no, he just, you know, I, I, which I just really don't understand. So that, but also cases where, you know, yes, where they declined to prosecute or, 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 or didn't bring a prosecution, absolutely, you can go back. The problem is that in a case like the Mount Vernon tapes case, as we've been calling it, you know, there are certain opportunities we'll just never get back. And that's a fact. Like there were opportunities there before this became public um, to do some kind of, you know, what we call covert or, or, or undercover type of action, like, like getting a, a, a wiretap or, or doing search warrants, as I said, on people's phones. I mean, that, that's just, obviously, you can't, you can't do that now. You don't have to be a prosecutor or, or a police officer or an agent to know that that opportunity is, is gone. And it's not the reporter's fault. I mean, it's, it's, the fault is that the failure to act went on for so long that people finally, including the reporter, felt like, you know, okay, this story has to get out because this is just sitting there and no one's doing anything. No. Um, so yes, there's still work to be done there, but I, I am afraid that, and, and so my question is in the context of this campaign, well, what other missed opportunities, what, what else are we missing now? You know, like we, this is the one we know about. What else has there been in action on? 
and, and failure to really look at the conduct. Whether, first, whether it rises to the level of criminal conduct, whether we've done a thorough, real investigation, and then even below that, like even if you're not going to charge someone, are there people, police officers, that you shouldn't be using as a prosecutor? Um, you know, I, I, I just don't think he sees that as part of his job, but it is. And then if there are things that you find that a police officer has done wrong, or anyone, a, a medical examiner, uh, you know, there, there's other people involved in cases, or a prosecutor, if you find that there are things that they've done wrong, mm -hmm. Do you then, have they gone back and looked at all the other exactly. cases that this worked on? And I know he's not doing that. And that's something, you know, really, really important to do. That's, I was, that's I was, exactly. I was very impressed when watching the district attorney from Atlanta hand down the charges of, in the killing of uh, Rayshard Brooks. And in addition, in handing out the charges, the criminal charges, he then um, handed out violation of oath charges, which I had never seen before. I'm not saying it never happened, but I had never seen a DA do that before in any of these kind of cases. And I was like, wow, you know, when you don't see what a DA is supposed to look like, you're like, that's what a DA is supposed to look like. Like, I, I, I just was, you know, I, I, I was, he, he was, he threw the he didn't throw the book he threw books at this at these individuals and 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 I thought that was strong and and a, and a great example especially for what we're going through right now. And the other thing that, that that DA did is he was very transparent, right? He didn't just get up there and say, "Okay, this is what I'm charging." He said he he walked everyone through it. You know, this is what happened. Here's the evidence review review. Here are the people we've spoken to. So, and, and, and then here are the charges and here's why, and here's why we think this charge is appropriate. That to me was one of the most remarkable things. Now, look, it's not always possible for someone in law enforcement to be that transparent about criminal charges because again, for the reasons I was talking about earlier, sometimes you have to keep things under wraps, close to the vest for purposes of enhancing the investigation. But he was at a, this, this DA was at a point where he felt he could be overt about it. He did it quickly. Um, and that's in contrast to the DA in Minneapolis and the murder of George Floyd, who several days in, after the murder came out. And I remember this news conference because it was, it was disturbing. He was making these very, you know, they hadn't charged anything yet. And it was, well, we're investigating, but you know, there's some evidence mm -hmm. that cuts against charging. And it was this very vague statement mm -hmm. that I think really contributed. I mean, it wasn't the, the only cause, but it contributed to the outrage of the moment because um, it, it was like, wait, what? What, are you, right. what evidence? What are you talking about? You know, it, either explain it or don't. But don't make vague statements like that. In, in that kind of situation, it's too important. So I think it goes back to the point about prosecutors, when at all possible, being transparent, not just imposing decisions on people, right? Because there's some people who don't like what, what the prosecutor in Atlanta did. But you know what? At least they have to give him credit for explaining right. it. And they can argue, they can argue with the decision. I understand that's what's gonna happen. But, but it's not just being imposed on people. It's, it's real explanation of his whole thought process. And I really respect that. I mean, that's something I would, I would strive to do. Again, you, you can't always be perfect at that. But I think just when you, when you want a whole community who is going to disagree on whatever decision you make, some people are gonna like it and some people aren't, mm -hmm. then you better be able to try and explain it if you can. Uh, particularly in, in, you know, in this time. And I wanted to mention, we were talking about conviction integrity. I just wanted to mention the person that, frankly, I found out about through your show that was incredible um, when you had on Karen Newworth from the Exoneration Project. Yes. Um, because she runs an, an exoneration, you know, a, an organization dedicated to exonerating people who have been wrongfully convicted. And they have a whole, before the reporting came out, before the reporting came out um, through George Joseph, through WMYC and Gothamist, she was on her own looking into people who she believes are wrongly convicted in Mount Vernon, including by these accused police officers. Now, I'm not here to say that's right or that's wrong. I don't have all of the facts, 
But the fact that she was even looking into it and she tried to get a meeting with Scarpino's office over a month ago and was ignored until just last week. So again, you know, people, anyone who questions like primaries, um, real challenges and campaigns should rethink it because we wouldn't even know about all of this. And he certainly wouldn't be responding to it if he wasn't being challenged in a primary. The other thing that a, the, the, the DA in Atlanta said, now one of the things, because I, I got a comment, he should have went to the grand jury first. He acknowledged that because of COVID, the grand juries wasn't really meeting until October. And then there were so many cases before this, this might not even be heard until January or something. And if he had the, if he had the power, he would sign the paper right now. You know what I'm saying? And he was questioning whether the DA should be able to press the charges without going to a grand jury and, 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 and asking the legislators to think about that. And, you know, I had not considered that, but since the question was brought up, you know, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, look, that, that would require legislation, obviously. Um, yeah. And he was basically asking the legislature to act. Um, I think it's definitely something worth discussing. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ready to say that, that we should or shouldn't, you know, do that. I mean, I think we have to, um, but, but I think it's absolutely something we should talk about. And another thing I think we should talk about, and I have brought this up previously um, in some debates and even mentioned it already to some uh, legislators, is thinking about the standard for what's considered excessive force. You know, right now it's a reasonableness standard. You know, was it reasonable in the eye, you know, in the eye, was it necessary in the eyes of a reasonable police officer? And, you know, I've heard other, other people talk about this too. I mean, is that too, too high or, or too much of a burden given what we know, you know, about the realities of, of how this works? Should it maybe be something like, it has to have been absolutely necessary or a measure of last resort. Because a lot of things are, could be reasonable, but, but still shouldn't be done. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so so I, think, I think, again, these are things that are complicated, but important to, to think about and talk about. And the people you need at the table to talk about that are legislators, district attorneys who will be bringing the cases, some representation from police officers. I believe that, you know, not, not someone who's just going to sit there and say, well, we shouldn't change anything, but someone who really wants to have a voice and, and have be part of the conversation and people from the community. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, probably other people, but the, the, at least that group of people. So, um, you know, I know there's a lot of like working groups and task forces being put together, but I, I hope that there is one that at least is comprised of, of those groups that can talk about those two issues. And I hope to have a seat at that table. Yeah, because that whole thing in Atlanta, they were talking about reasonable force, they were like, they were questioning, they were pointing out that Rashad pointed the taser at him, but in other police cases, the officer couldn't be charged because the taser is not a lethal weapon in the state of Georgia. So you kind of can't have it both ways when it's a police officer, it's not a lethal weapon, but we shot him because he shot the taser at me, you know, like, and at that well, distance. It depends, on, it depends on what, it depends on what state you're in. Like we- Oh, no, like, no, we talk about Georgia. Like, That's we, what it, they were going back and forth in Georgia with both those. Right, yeah, yeah, because like, like in New York State, if someone takes your nightstick, you, oh, yes. you're justified in shooting him because the nightstick is deadly force. That's what right. we were taught. Now, right. whether it changed, I don't know. Because I'm not intentional to let nobody get my <laughs> because <laughs> but you, you know, but the whole thing is that's usually if you're not trained in it, it you know, I mean it's a it's a deadly but Georgia's law does not see a taser as a as a deadly weapon. Right. Um, even and, 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 he, and they even said at that distance in, and they said at that distance, because they, they 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 pointed out how far away he was when he did that that it could not have done but so much damage to him. And then um, then they also pointed out that he had already pushed it two times. So by the time he was shot, oh, right. like the taser was this was no use. Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a threat at that time he was shot. Cause right. it, you know, yeah. So anyway, enough of that. Well, well that's what I said because the officer, yeah, 
Yeah, but um, I, I think that, I mean, we, how many, the, the thing is, how, how many reviews are committees that we're going to make recommendations over the recommendations over the recommendations? I've been, I've been working corrections for 30 years. You know, I, I, could, I could pull a whole folder out of different reports after every incident, after this incident, after that incident, after this incident. You know, now, like, eight years later, we passed the, 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 the chokehold bill. But it's just like I told elected officials, law enforcement, a lot of these young guys, they train mixed martial arts and all this other crazy stuff. They don't have to kill you with a chokehold. <laughs> you know, I mean, they could kill you with something else. And so, George Floyd was so not killed with a chokehold. He was killed exactly. with a neck. That's not a chokehold. Right. Exactly. So now can, can since you passed no chokehold bill, so now can I actually use the knee to the neck because, because you passed the no chokehold bill? You know, I've always said it's any violation of policy, procedure, and training that leads to serious injury or death. That that covers everything. If you if they if they have passed that law, it covers everything. It covers excessive force all the way up to deadly force. Because mm -hmm. what are you taught? What is in your policy, right? What is in your procedure? And if what you did is not in none of that, then you got a problem, right? You 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 have a serious you have a serious problem. But I think I think they're going to run into loopholes with these unions, um, with with the chokehold bill down 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 the line because these kids, these these young guys coming in, they're taking all type they're they're taking all type of different martial arts and and, and different things like that. I did when I was in my twenties and thirties, and and I know these guys are doing it too, you know. So they can hurt you with other with with with, with other type of 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 maneuvers and and, and holes that won't be considered a chokehold. And now, um, I know, I know, you know, um, your time is valuable, and you may have uh, somewhere else to go or do right after this. Um, any last words you want to say to the undecided voter on why they should vote for you? Why are you the candidate to take the district attorney's office to this a new to the a new place where we need to be, especially in this national climate of protest and calls for criminal justice reform so yeah i mean look i really think it comes down to um you know what kind of leadership people want in that office you know and right now we have someone who's very passive who isn't proactive who like i said at the beginning doesn't have a vision about i'm not even sure totally understands what criminal justice reform really needs you know um you know the the one example he keeps going back to is is you know how he supposedly eliminated um, bail for low level marijuana offenses uh, before it was the law was passed. Although he frankly did it when it was clear the law was going to be passed. But we're way past that now. We are talking about reimagining the criminal justice system. We need to redefine. And you guys are making this point, right? You're saying. It isn't about eliminating one thing that a police officer can do that might kill someone. I mean, yes, that's important, but it's really about changing a culture. Right. And, you know, some of that's going to be in my job description, but some of it's just going to be like, this is what I care about. And, and, right. and my, I'm the kind of going to be the kind of DA who's going to try to bring the police to the table. Like some of them won't, some of them will dig their heels in and, and that's fine. But, the, but I believe there are some we can bring along to 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 agree on some of the reforms that we're talking about and changing the culture and we need them we need those allies in the police department and that you know that doesn't mean that if they resist then we give up but i do believe that that a lot of the way to to make this change happen so it's not just another recommendation as you say that sits on the table is to try to harness the, the, the people that, that can be changed, that are, in, that are in the police departments in our county, that, that, that do understand that change is here and change needs to happen. And I believe that we have a lot of them. It's not about, not the police unions, you know, it's about the, the individual people working there and, and the, the young people coming in, that they're trained in a different way, as you say, that they're not trained in the same old, same old way. And then that prosecutors, prosecutors need to be 
uh, to have their culture change. You know, it can't just be about convictions. It needs to be a culture where you can admit mistakes. You're not afraid to admit mistakes because that's how prosecutors get into a lot of problems. Um, it's about, you know, making it a priority um, to have diversion programs, to have restorative justice. I heard the DA say in one of our last debates, well, you know, restorative justice is very expensive and we're not gonna have any money. Yes, I understand we're gonna have budget problems, but guess what? Restorative justice programs in the long run save money. So we, you know, and, and you can get grants. And I mean, there, you, like you can't just throw up your hands and say, well, it's too expensive, we can't do anything. Um, that's not gonna change anything. So look, I mean, if people are in, you know, satisfied with the way the criminal justice system is running in Westchester right now, then they should vote for him again. But if they think it really needs to change and they want someone who's gonna put their heart and soul into trying to change it, I mean, I can't promise I'm gonna be successful with everything I try, but if they want someone who's gonna really try and try to bring different players to the table um, to make it happen, then, then that's me. Um, and I want to say, excuse me, there's people in the background. I wanted to say again, um, one of the other reasons that really stood by Black Westchester endorsing Mimi was the fact that um, you made the commitment publicly that you will not take donations from PBAs, um, police unions, where they represent police officers you might have to prosecute or elected officials where they may be potential people you could have to prosecute or lawyers that will face cases before your office. I, I really haven't heard that kind of talk before. And that was very impressive. Huh? Huh? We never heard, we never heard that talk before. We yeah, and I, I pledged that back in December. You know, now you're hearing this in the wake of George Floyd's murder. You're hearing a cry right. across the country for prosecutors to stop taking money from police unions. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we talked about this back in December. The DA right now has taken um, over $10,000 in donations from police unions, including this year. So, um, you know, he says now he's not going to take any more, you know, I don't know, but he certainly hasn't given any of it back or donated it to anyone. Right, right, right. I had a question. I'm trying to find it. One person asked, um, one person made a comment, time for meaningful change, time to stop criminalizing parenting in Westchester. Um, I, that was more of a comment. Um, Oh, it's right here. You're talking about Crystal's question? Yes, yes. Because when I close it and come back in, I lose the going oh, back to the okay. questions. Yeah, Crystal's question. Um, should Mimi be elected, who will she ensure is on her transition team to help her elect the it help elect those qualified individuals? Um, in addition, a question was raised to her about when she was appointed person in White Plains, how many African-American Blacks, um, did she have in her leadership roles? This question was never, this question was never asked, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's what she. So, I mean, I'll answer that question first. I mean, there, there are no leadership roles in the White Plains office. It, it, the only leadership roles were me and my co-chief who were appointed by the U.S. attorney, who was Preet Bharara. There, there is no, Everybody else there is a is a line prosecutor, and they come. They're they're fed to the White Plains office from the downtown office. I did work on the hiring committee for the whole Southern District of New York under Pre Ferrara, so not just White Plains, but also Manhattan. Um, and while I was not in a, the position to be making final decisions, that was the, the, the U.S. Attorney and the Deputy U.S. Attorney uh, and the Criminal Division Chief. I was, as I said earlier, part of screening the applications that came in and doing interviews for the, the sort of first round interviews. And there was an incredible push for diversity um, by, by Pre Ferrara, um, you know, under Obama uh, and, and Eric Holder was, was the AG at the time. Um, and like I said, we did, you know, we, we made, did panels where we went out and, and talked to different uh, like black, law students associations, women's students associations, Hispanic student associations to try and recruit um, people, people of color uh, for positions. 
uh, went to law schools that had never previously been gone to um, by the U.S. Attorney's Office to try and recruit people. So um, I don't I don't know the numbers off the top of my head because again, you know, it, there's a difference between being the DA who is responsible for hiring um, mm -hmm. as opposed to in my office it it was people above me. But I but I absolutely had a role in the hiring committee and this was something we very much prioritized but in the white plains office itself it was prosecutors and then me and my co-chief those were the only leadership positions that there were and pre picked us okay um shout out to a lot of people that are tuned in um and, and then i noticed you also which was very telling you also received a, um endorsement from someone that was close to scarpino and a supporter of scarpino and the yonkers um, city Council President, who was this? Who said in his statement, even though he knew Tony for a long time and always had supported him, he was disturbed at how it went down with the Malvern tapes. His Tony's handling of that totally disturbed him to the point that it made him rethink a lifelong relationship and 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 and, and support, and then rescind it and then support you. That I think that was kind of big, especially in the in that Yonkers community, you know, where he's as a, a big voice. Yeah, no, and look, and, and that takes that takes a lot of um, courage to to switch your endorsement. You know, nobody does that lightly, um, particularly when it's somebody who's known a long time. But he, like many people, I mean I, I can't tell you know, and there were other people who didn't necessarily switch their endorsement but had been neutral. And when these, this reporting came out and they read it, um, and despite you know, Scarpino's sort of statements and defenses, they decided then to publicly endorse me. Like Kidley Coville had, had been trying to maintain some neutrality because of her position overseeing criminal justice as a county legislator. Um, you know, and, and I mean, as you guys know, I have a, a lot of endorsements in Mount Vernon, um, some who've been with me from day one, some who, uh, you know, I think we're, we're more willing to come forward after um, this reporting, understandably, because it is, it's just shocking. Um, and uh, Hakeem Jeffries uh, endorsed me last week. Um, and he's someone who, you know, has been fighting at the federal level for criminal justice reform for a long time. Um, and, uh, and, and he basically said, look, if, you know, my view of, of this race is that if you want um, change and you want to you know, change all the things that we're, we're rallying about and talking about, then we need to change the district attorney. So I, I was quite honored um, by that endorsement. Um, um, someone that's a supporter of yours, and I guess works in the campaign, uh, later she had answered Crystal on, on in the message oh, yeah, section question. before yeah. before before we asked the question. And she said, Crystal, those are very good points. But I will tell you, I will tell you that this is something I looked at before working with Mimi who did who who did she have around her as part of her team she basically has a united nation mimi is a friend super smart has integrity the experience and i work with her because i know she can do better and i just that was her answer to crystal before i actually got to answer the question she answered it in the message section any yeah, last questions let me, okay, let me address it real quick i mean Elena makes makes not surprisingly a good point because she's a smart a smart lady herself um, that, you know, yeah, my campaign team is, is very diverse um, and, and that is intentional. I mean, I, you know, it didn't just happen. I have good people on my campaign, but I also wanted it to be diverse and reflect uh, the county, unlike, you know, my opponent's campaign team. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of a transition team, I mean, look, I'm not going to get into like obviously you know specific names right now i mean i i that that's you know three steps down the road after tuesday but sure there's there's people in the community um that i have in mind that i, I would love to you know have be part of my team or part of my office um you know we'll see i mean everyone's everyone's got things that they're doing but it, it's it's got to include the community too you know yeah. it's got to include members of the community and um you know, I, I understand that. And, and I understand it's not something I can do alone. It's not something I should do alone. Um, it's got to include lawyers who are actually connected to the community. And it's got to include community members who aren't lawyers as well. Right. right. Um, anything I didn't ask you, you want the voters to know 
where you at on the ballot, your social media, website, people can look, go from this to look up more information on you? Yeah, so I mean, I, I would just highlight that at this point, um, you know, basically early voting is over, but people can still send in their absentee ballots. Uh, they can be postmarked as late as Tuesday, election day. Um, they can vote on Tuesday. They sh you know, uh, the polls are open, I think, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, it may not be their exact same polling place as usual because of COVID, so they should check that out. Um, on our website, um, Mimi Roca 4 forda.com. Um, we have uh, information about that. They can also go to the Board of Elections uh, website, but I encourage them to go to our website. Um, if they're not already following me on social media, um, you know, my DA page is uh, Mimi Roca 4 da uh, for district attorney, sorry. Um, and I'm on Twitter, Mimi Roca one um, and on Instagram, I think it's Mimi Roca 4 the number four DA. Um, so, you know, we can, and we, I think you have the links on, on your uh, page yes, as well. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, look, we're at the point that, you know, it, it's basically just about getting out the vote. Um, if people are undecided and they have specific questions, you know, through you or they can uh, email our campaign, hello at Mimi Roca 4 da um, if, you know, if they feel that there's questions that they need to help them decide. Um, but, you know, I think, I think it's a really clear choice. I mean, yes, we can, you know, there, I understand that people have a lot of very specific questions and those should be answered, but, but you, the, the differences in our leadership and styles and vision and energy and passion about this, these issues is pretty stark in my view. I, I want to add in closing, this is the most important election in Westchester right now, especially for communities of color. Um, I just want to, for all of those people that I commended it early on, the young people, the people out there in every one of the municipalities of Westchester protesting and, and calling for criminal justice reform and the national attention that we got. If we go back to what we just, what we have now, all of the work that Joe have done is for nothing. You know what I mean? Like, this is an opportunity. And, and, and the changes that you said you want to make, this is one of the first opportunities that can be done locally by v voting the current district attorney out and voting for Mimi Roca um as as the new head of the district as the new district attorney that is the first chance that you can make the first action outside of the protesting and all the work that you've been doing the, this is the this is the and and what's next this is the what's next this is the first action item in the what's next voting in this election you, you understand what i'm saying because we've seen and they had three years is not a long time but three years is a very long time we have not seen this district attorney. He has been visibly absent in a lot of situations. He is coming on now as for campaign promises again. And, and, and he has failed this, this, this county and especially the city of Mount Vernon. And, 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 and there's a bunch of examples in Black Westchester and you can just Google you know, his record and, 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 and all the stuff going on. But if you really are sick and tired of being sick and tired of what was going on locally in the nationally period, but first everything is local. This is the first thing you can do locally, vote in this election. And my recommendation is that you vote this cat out and you vote her in. And that and that's one of the, the first action item of the what's next after all the protesting that you physically can do yourself as 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 the voter. Um, and I and I and I make that very strongly and I, and I wanted to have you on There's two days before this election. There's a lot of people that's undecided. There are a lot of links on Black Westchester if you want to look. If you don't can't find it, c contact me, blackwestchester at gmail.com. Um, she's giving you her information to contact her. If you have specific questions that need to be addressed that you feel may not have got addressed in this interview, I apologize to some of the people there were a lot of comments and some questions that i were not able to get to but she said you can reach out to her at hello at mimi roca um 
what was it again? Hello at me. At me, Roca, 4DA.com. Right. If you want, and if you feel that I wasn't able to answer your question, please email her campaign and someone will get back to you uh, on the answer. And I, I think like this is seriously, this is, this is, if we go back, we keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. The, the Democratic Party keeps telling you this is our nominee. Everybody should support that person. But where has that gotten you? I'm not saying switch your party. I'm saying make up your own mind. Don't go vote for someone because the, the, the district attorney, I mean, sorry, the, 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 the county chair or the party said, this is the person you should vote for. You should vote for the best person in every seat, now, especially in situations where there's a ticket. I'm not even for vote for a whole ticket. Vote for the best person in every position. But don't stop. We have to stop listening to the Democratic Party or in Republican areas, the Republican Party that gives you that vote row A all the way. That's why we keep being in the situation that we're in now. And if you want to continue doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, that is the definition of insanity. So you say you want to change. Y'all are out there making the choice between social distancing and social justice, which is a hell of a choice to have to make, risking your lives to prove the point and make some noise. Well, this is the this is the next part of the protest. You protest, you want to protest, protest at the ballot box and vote this cat out of there because he has not done anything for anybody. That's it. Black West just endorses Mimi Roper. <laughs> that is so better than I could. I <laughs> Last words, Damon. Anything you want to put um, out? Um, people forget that Black Westchester was started of an idea when f how many was it? Four or five parole officers. Four, you know, yeah, four black parole officers. When, yes. when four black New York State parole officers were pulled out of their gun out of their cars. They had shields around their necks. They had vests on that said New York State Parole. They was in a state car that was registered to the New York State Parole. And they was pulled over by police over in Ramapo. In Rock put on Ramapo put guns down, put on the ground. And we did not like the coverage um, that the media gave these four officers who dedicated their lives as as parole officers. And before that, I have dealt with district attorneys um, in cases of police brutality. And every year, election time, we get the rig we get the rigmarole. Right, we get we get the good story, we get coming, but something you know, none of them talked about um, reform, just reform to the justice system, uh, reform to the DA's office, reform to the to 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 the police department. Um, uh, none of them talked about that. We see. You know, the, the usual in last election, you know, Democrat nominee, everybody votes row A. And then with these three years, we, we see our result, right? And and I think I, I, I was always someone who say that the district attorney was the most important per person that black people can vote for. But after God put the world on hold and put everybody inside and for eight minutes and 45 seconds, the whole world watched a man die with a cop with his knee to his neck. Now, the international conversation about the justice system and how communities, poor com even poor white communities, um, are policed, every, we're all talking about it. Right, we 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 all talking about it, but we have an election day that we can actually, you know, do make a change it. and do something about it. So you know, I, I'm I'm nervous because this is an opportunity, you know, for for us to make change. 
but I'm I'm nervous because I've been doing this for 30 years, right? And and at the point is that do we really want change? Are we really are we really ready for change? Do we really want change? Are we really ready to work for change? Um, put someone in the office that's willing to work for with the people and for the people, you know, um, um, for change. Are we ready for that? If we are ready for that, I think people need to go out on Tuesday. They should go out. They 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 should take take that five minutes and find your poll polling station and 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 go vote. Um, I think the Mount Vernon tapes says it all. I, I, you know, if, let me tell you, if you just popped on the planet earth and you just heard the Mount Vernon tapes, I think you, you, you are intelligent enough to say something's wrong with that guy. Um, he should, he, he shouldn't be there. Of, of all the other stories that we give, I think the Mount Vernon tape says, says it all. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking people um, to go out there on the 23rd, you know, vote for Mimi Roca, um, and, and, and let's invest, you know, we have to invest and we invest, we invest in the justice system, you know, through our vote and we all can be stakeholders and change. I think that's what it's all about. Um, working with George Lattimore, you know, on those committees, you know, I see the process can be done. It's not an overnight process, but it's a, it's a process that takes is that 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 takes his time because we're dealing with a hundred years of legislation as as uh, Michelle Alexander in in the new Jim Crow that we have to try to address and, and and reverse but we have to have people in office that that are willing you know to take on that and willing to sit down with the with the powerful police unions you know I don't really think they're that powerful but powerful police unions you know to sit down and bring them and bring them to the table also and elected officials have to bring them to the table but it's easy for them right they just got to put a raise to it they'll sign off anything <laughs> but <laughs> but we have to we have to really you know put people in place and this is our opportunity westchester i mean we 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 complained about um janine piero we really complained about janet de Fior. We complained about Scarpino. Now we have someone that's coming out of the gate saying, look, the system needs to be reformed. The system needs to be changed. Give me the opportunity to work with the community and work with other law enforcement agencies in changing the system. We have never heard that before. Never, never heard that. In my 30 years in law enforcement, I've never heard that before. So I think we have the opportunity and let's go out there and let's put Mimi Roca in office so we could begin that process. And that's all. That's, and thank you, Mimi, for giving us your, your, your time tonight. Yeah, I, I thank you for your time. And, and, I, and I will say here on the record, and Richard Thomas has found this out, if I support you, I'm going to hold you accountable. So, 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 so let that be known. Like, I'm not just telling y'all to vote. Like, I'm going to... Because it's... <laughs> so, so, so I, I just want to say that on the record now. I'm going to say it both without the accountability part. I'm going to be there. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So we thank, we thank you for your time. Any last words? And as we out of here, vote Mimi Roker for Westchester DA Tuesday. Yes. Thanks, you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you, you know, to, to everyone who's listening for taking the time to listen because it is an important race. It's, it's, uh, you know, Obama said it a couple weeks ago. He said, this is where you make the change that you're protesting and rallying about is at the DA office level, you know, other offices too, but this is the one that's on the ballot, right? I mean, mayors matter and, uh, and, and you know, I think we have a great opportunity now with, with the new mayor um, and, uh, you know, police chiefs and, you know, whoever's in charge of law enforcement. And the DA plays a really important role. It's not, it's not the only role, but it's, it's an important role. And there's so much more we could do with that office. You know, it, it can be exactly. an engine for change. Exactly, exactly. With that, this is the end of the Black Westchester Presents the People Before Politics radio show, episode 266, um, the pre-primary edition. Um, you could be doing anything else right now, but you, just, you decided to ride with us and we greatly appreciate it. Go out and vote um, Tuesday. Uh, make your vote count. And until next week, we out. Peace.
Peace. Good night.